The scripture reading today comes from the first letter to the Corinthians, starting in chapter 15, from verses 1 through 4. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Moreover, the brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Good morning. We are so grateful for your presence today, especially those of you who are visiting. You are our most honored and welcome guests. We hope that you will uh, hang around after the services today and visit around with us, get to know us. And if you should have any questions about anything you have seen or anything you will hear in this sermon, feel free to ask us about that. Of course, you know what day it is and you know what I'm going to say. Happy Poppy's Day. Uh, show some love to Dad today. Uh, dads and moms are important in our, in our families, and we honored moms last month, and this month we honor our fathers, and so let's show some love to them. Uh, they will not be with us forever, and when they're gone, we will dearly miss them, and so make sure you acknowledge that to your father. Had a great VBS last week. If you missed that, uh, you missed something. I think it was one, personally, I think it was one of the best ones we've had. They've all been good. It's one of the best ones we've had. Uh, and uh, we're grateful to everyone for everything you did, for your attendance, for bringing your children, for the children and their participation, the teachers, everything that was done. I'm sure I've overlooked something because it takes a ton of work uh, to make something like that happen. And a lot of people contributed to that and we're grateful for it. Also want to mention that this week is the men's class on Thursday night and I do have sheets out there. We're using books, but I always prepare an outline too to kind of go along with it. Uh, we've been looking at the I Am's of Christ, and this week we're going to be looking at John 14, 6, I Am, the way, the truth, and the life. And there are sheets out there in the foyer, uh, so please pick up one of those so you'll be better prepared for the class on Thursday night. The text that was read, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, uh, this sermon today links in with our Sunday night studies that we've been having. We've been studying about the atonement of Christ, the sacrifice of Christ is the same thing as what we're talking about what Jesus did for us on the cross. And this lesson connects in with that. One of the points that I have made uh, repeatedly through that series of classes is that the cross was not designed to change God. God has always been gracious and merciful and willing to forgive. The cross was designed to change us. And so this lesson will expand on that theme, uh, how the cross changes me. But in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4, Paul says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which you received, and in which you stand, and by which you're saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Notice that the gospel is not just facts, uh, and he's going to mention some of those facts in the next couple of verses. It's not just that, but it's something that's to be held fast to, something that's to be followed by us. So it contains commandments. It contains things that we're to do, obligations for us. He says, if you hold fast that word. And then he gets to the heart of the gospel in verses 3 and 4. For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received. In the New American Standard Version and perhaps the NIV, ESV, and other versions, it brings out the better meaning of that phrase, first of all. It really means of foremost importance. And what he's driving at here is that these facts that he's about to enunciate are the center and the core of the gospel. And the cross... Uh, being the center of the gospel also becomes the center of my life. Everything that we do as Christians is built around the cross, and that's what this lesson is all about. But notice what he says in verse 3, I delivered to you first of all that which I received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. The heart of the gospel. Notice that Christ did not die for His sins. He had none. He did no sin nor was there any guile found in his mouth. The sinless sacrifice, the spotless Lamb of God, but it was for our sins that he died. And he says all of that was according to the Scriptures. He's alluding there to the Old Testament Scriptures. The New Testament had not been completed yet, was in the process of being written, even as he writes these very words, in the process of being written. But Christ died for our sins according to the Old Testament Scriptures, that he was buried 
and that he rose again the third day. You cannot be a Christian if you do not believe those things. You cannot go to heaven if you do not believe those things. Christ is our Savior. He saves us from our sins, and if our sins are not taken away, we cannot go to heaven because sin keeps us separated from God. Sin keeps us from being able to go to heaven, and only in Christ are those sins removed. So you must believe that He died for your sins, that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day. Those things identify Him as the Son of God. And that phrase is a Jewish expression, a Hebrew type expression. Son of means having the characteristics of. So when Jesus is described as the Son of God, what it's saying to us is that He is God, that He is divine, that He is deity. And you cannot go to heaven if you do not believe in the deity of Jesus Christ. All of these things are at the heart and the core of the gospel and they should become the core of our lives. But how is it uh, that the cross becomes the core of my life. And how is it that the cross changes me? There are a number of passages. I just sat down the other day and I got to thinking about this because I had made that point several times in the uh, atonement study on Sunday nights. And I got to thinking, you know, there are a whole host of passages that make a direct link. And uh, all the passages, and you can see them on the back of your, uh, of your family report, all those passages link the cross directly to our lives, link the cross directly to uh, the effect that the cross has upon our lives. And so let's take a look at that uh, in the lesson this morning. The first thing I'd suggest to you is that I embrace the cross in my conversion. You ever thought about that? Turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 6 in verses 1 through 4. Now Paul has spent the first five chapters talking about the need that we have for salvation, the fact that we're all sinners whether we're Jew or Gentile, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, that we cannot therefore save ourselves because good deeds don't remove sin. That's, that's, the, that's the ugly truth of life. Good deeds don't remove If you stop sinning today and never committed another sin for the rest of your life, it wouldn't erase what you've done in the past. Those sins still have to be dealt with, you see. And Jesus is the means of dealing with that. So the first five chapters laying all that groundwork that we're all sinners, that Jesus is the only way. And then... He, he mentions here in chapter 6 and verse 1, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God is gracious. God is loving. God is forgiving. And he said back there in chapter 5 in verse 20, notice that just prior to this, the law entered, he's talking there about the law of Moses, the law entered that the offense might abound. That is to really point out our transgressions and to magnify them. And he says, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So there's always plenty of grace. More grace then there, then there is sin. Plenty of grace to take care of the sin. Well, that raises a question. Well, if that's true, where sin abounds, grace abounds even more, then why don't we just keep on sinning? That's his question, you see. And so he asks it right there. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. That's what got us into trouble. Sinning is what got us into trouble in the first place. You can't keep doing that and go to heaven. Expect everything to be all right. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? Therefore we were buried with Him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. You remember those core truths in the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians. Christ died for our sins. He was buried. He rose again. He says that's the heart of the gospel. And when we come to Christ, guess what? We have to embrace that. This is your way, when you're, when you're baptized into Christ, this is your way of saying yes to Jesus. This is your way of saying yes to the cross. Yes, I get this. Yes, I understand this. Yes, I accept this. Yes, I embrace this. And notice that there is a death that you must die. He said in verse 2 of Romans 6, How shall we who died to sin live any longer? You have to die. Jesus died for you, now you have to die. And you have to die to your sins. He died for your sins, but you have to die to your sins. It means you can't live in them any longer. Uh, we call that repentance. That's the Bible word for it, repentance. That's death to sin, separating yourself from sin, turning your life around. And then Jesus was buried. He died for our sins and He was buried. And we have to be buried with Him. You see, we're embracing this. We're embracing the cross when we're converted. We're saying yes to Jesus and yes to the cross. We're, we're buried with Him by baptism into death. That's His death. We, that's where the old preachers used to say that's where you contact the blood of Christ. Now nobody is saying when we say that, that's a figurative expression, nobody is saying that there's really blood in this tank right here. It's just a tank of water behind this wall. That's all that it is or wherever you happen to be baptized. If it's in the creek or the lake or wherever, uh, there, there's no blood in there. But that's where you contact the benefits. You're buried with Him by baptism into death. That's where you embrace this, you see. And you put this on. And then 
the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, Christ was raised. And we too are raised from the watery grave of baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. And so when you're converted to Christ, this is a complete embracing of the cross. And so you see how the cross changes us? It's already started. At the very beginning of your life as a Christian, you've come face to face with the reality that Jesus died for you and that Jesus was buried and that He rose from the dead. And you embrace that reality and you emulate that reality by dying yourself to your sins, being buried with Him and being raised to walk in a new life. So I embrace the cross and that's how it changes me, starting at the very beginning of my conversion process. Now, notice this too, and we did this this morning. I remember the cross in my worship every Sunday. And isn't that a great way to start the week? Sunday is the first day of the week. Every week begins with a Sunday. Every week has a Sunday in it. And according to the scripture, that's when the disciples met. That's when Christians met together to remember Jesus Christ. And every Sunday we're remembering that cross. That's a great way to start the week. You're reminded once again of what our Savior did. Turn to 1 Corinthians 11. And Paul lays down some very explicit instructions here. This is what we're supposed to do. And he says in 1 Corinthians 11, and this goes all the way back. Think of this. I, I think of this often. That what we do here every Sunday goes all, can be traced all the way back to Jesus Christ Himself. He started this. He instituted this. And Christians have done this for 2,000 years. And he says in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23, Paul says, I received from the Lord that which I delivered to you. There's a tradition being set forth, an inspired tradition being set forth. It was given to me directly from the Lord, and I gave it to you at Corinth, and by implication to us as well. I received from the Lord that which I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed, Think of that when anybody else would have been thinking about their own safety. Anybody else would have been panicking. Jesus is taking the time to say, look, we need to understand what's going on here. We need to understand that I'm dying for your sins, and I'm going to institute a memorial. He's very clear-headed about all of this. And so on the very night he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. The as often as. Tells, other scriptures tell us that that's the first day of the week. Every week. As often as we do this. Every single week. We meet together. We meet around this table in the kingdom of God. And we remember the cross. And that, that impacts us. You ever been sitting there taking the Lord's Supper and find a tear come to your eye? Usually that happens to me most of the time when we're singing the song before the communion. Whatever song is selected, usually the song leader gives some thought to that, and it's always a song that is designed to just sort of reach in there and grab your heart and squeeze it real good and say, look at there what Jesus did for you. And the tear will come. And, and, and the sadness will come because you know what you are. You're a sinner. Lost and undone. And yet Jesus loved you. And gave his life. And you remember that every week. The cross changes me. You see, I didn't used to do that. Before I became a Christian, I didn't, I didn't assemble regularly. I didn't take the Lord's Supper. Uh, I didn't do those things. But the cross has changed me. Now, every week, I never miss a week unless I'm just sick. I never miss a week when that doesn't happen. It touches me. It affects me. It changes me. But you know, there's more to this. I emulate the cross in my benevolence. Turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. This is quoted a lot in our Sunday morning assemblies when we take up the collection. I think this morning we quoted 1 Corinthians 16. But usually, and it doesn't matter which passage, I'm not saying which one you should quote or which one you shouldn't quote, but usually we quote 2 Corinthians. And usually it's 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 6, but 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, the whole two chapters there, Paul is writing about this collection uh, that they're taking up for the saints in Jerusalem, the churches of Macedonia and Achaia, which would include the church at Corinth. They're, taking, they're all taking up a collection for the needy saints in Jerusalem. And Paul is writing about that and instructing them about how to do this and the proper way to do it. And, and so they're giving benevolent aid to the church in Jerusalem. And Paul sets forth Jesus as the example of how to give, the ultimate example of what better gift, what greater gift could there be than the gift of His Son on the cross. And so we read, in 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 8, I'm going to start with verse 8. 
He says, I speak not by commandment, but I'm testing the sincerity of your love by the diligence of others. Now, think about that, giving. We, we oftentimes frame giving as though it were a commandment, and in a sense that's true. But he's saying here, if it's a real gift, it's not done out of a response to some commandment. A gift is something done willingly, not, not grudgingly, not something that's, that's forced out of you. It's something that's done willingly. And so he's testing the sincerity of their love. If you love, you give. If you love, you help, you see. And so I'm testing the sincerity of your love by the diligence of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. Rich, referring to the time when he was in heaven, before he came to this earth. Rich, up there with God, up there with the Father, up there in heaven, having uh, uh, no problems whatsoever. He's, he's God Himself. He's in charge. He's master of the universe. But He becomes poor. He puts on human flesh. He comes down here. And when He puts on human flesh, by the way, He's not born into a king's mansion. He's born as the son of a carpenter. Raised up as the son of a carpenter. Lived His life as a carpenter until He began His ministry and began to teach, you see. So He became poor in the ultimate sense. And the ultimate poverty then was the giving up of His life. He gave it all up, you see. Died for us, dying on the cross, that you through His poverty, that is through His coming here and dying, might become rich. And that's the ultimate example of giving. And He's saying here, if you could see that, if you can understand that, you understand the importance of giving. And you see how it affects you? It affects your giving. People say, well, I don't really want to give to the church. Here's a dollar. Not if you understand the cross. Not if you, that's not your attitude if you understand the cross. If you understand the cross, it's how much can I do? How far can I go? Because Jesus went so far for me. He gave so much for me. So what's the best I can do? That's the way you should look at your giving. That's the way you should look at your benevolence. And, and, and so when it comes to laying by in store on the first day of the week, or for, any, for that matter, any giving that we do, whether it's helping our neighbor or helping a family member, What's the most that I can do? What's the best that I can do? Because Christ did the most and did the best for me. And so the cross, once again, affects me. It affects the way that I give. It affects the way that I look at this. It, and so instead of being stingy, I'm generous. Because the cross has made me that way. The cross has changed me. And so I emulate the cross in my benevolence. Well, another aspect of all of this is that we all have interpersonal relationships. We deal with people. We deal with people at home. We deal with people at work. We deal with people in the local congregation. We deal with people in the community. We deal with people all of the time. And the cross affects our interpersonal relationships. Did you know that? Someone who understands the cross is a nice guy. Isn't that interesting? Someone who truly understands the cross is a nice guy. He's humbled by the cross in order to respect other people. And that's really Paul's entire point in the book of Philippians chapter 2. Turn over there and read that with me. He's talking specifically here about relationships with brothers and sisters in Christ. There was a time, and I think I may have mentioned it a week or two back in one of the sermons, there was a time when churches of Christ, uh, and I would say, and I only say this because I know this area and, and grew up here, but it was especially true in this area. A lot of brethren just didn't get along very well. Churches, every time you turn around, split here, split there, go off here, form this church, go off there and form that. Brethren didn't get along. And, and I would submit to you, because we don't understand the cross. That was a problem. That's what we've got to get focused on the cross. We focus on the cross, and suddenly it's going to impact the way we relate to each other. In Philippians 2, starting with about verse 3, look at this. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition. That's what I want. Selfish ambition is all about me. Because that's what the culture teaches us out there. It's all about you. What you want, what you like, what you think, what you wish, what you desire. It's all about you. And the Bible says, no, it's not all about you. Even, not even God said it was all about Him because He came and died for us. It was about us. It's about others. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. That's arrogance. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Now notice verse 4 carefully. He's saying it's okay to look out for your interests to a point. You've got to take care of yourself. You've got to provide for yourself. So he says, don't look out only for your own interests, but also for the interests. We've got to think about the other guy too. can't just think about self. got to think about others. But then he says, 
Jesus was the ultimate example of this. Let this mind, what mind? This mind of doing nothing from selfish ambition, doing nothing from conceit, but being lowly in mind and looking out for others. That's the mind. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a servant and coming in the likeness of men. That's very similar to Paul's, though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor. It's the same basic idea. So Jesus condescended. He came down to this low land of sin and sorrow. He put on flesh. He came in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, the ultimate in humility, and became obedient to the point of death. Here it is, even the death of the cross. There's the cross. One of the worst forms of death known to man. Cruel, brutal, bloody, nails driven into your hands, nails driven into your feet, hanging there in an unnatural position where you cannot breathe, and you slowly but surely asphyxiate. Sometimes men were known to hang there for days, days on end before they finally died. But Jesus had been beaten very badly before he was put there. And, and Jesus has the burden of thinking about what he's going through here as God. And he didn't deserve this. And he, he doesn't last very long. He lasts about six hours on that cross. But it was a brutal and agonizing and terrible way to die. And he did that because of his humility. Because he loved us. Because he put us first. And he's saying in that very text, he's saying that's how you need to relate to your fellow man. That's how you need to relate to your brothers and sisters in Christ. That's how you need to relate to your wives. That's how you need to relate to your husbands. That's how you need to relate to your children. Humble, giving, serving. And the cross can change you. The cross can make you into that kind of person. That's what the cross can do. Because Jesus did this, I can do this. He's not asking you to do anything He hasn't already done. He hasn't asking you anything He's not willing to do. He's done it. He's been there. He's done that. And He wants you to do the same in your relationships with others. So, and in fact, I just, just popped into my head here as a great illustration of this, and I've, I've brought this up before, I think, in the class. You think about our, our, our military, uh, totally voluntary. And they go, and they put their lives on the line for their country. That's humble service. That's what Jesus did. He put his life on the line for the whole world. And our soldiers go and put their life on the line. And, and, and you think there's, there's humility there. There's giving there. There's sacrifice there. And, and you, you begin to get the flavor. The cross can revolutionize your life. It can humble you and bring you low before God and make you a better person, make your relationships better with other folks. You emulate it when you give. You remember it in your worship so you never forget. You never forget what Jesus did. And, of course, you embraced it when you were converted to Christ. But there's even more to the story. I'm motivated by the cross to obedience. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and we've, we've looked at this passage several times in our atonement study, I think this is a central passage in the whole shebang. He says in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 14, For the love of Christ constrains us, because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. I like the way the old King James renders this, all were dead. The implication is if Jesus died for us, that implies that we were all dead. We were all dead in our sins, lost and undone. And He died for all, here's why, that those who live should no longer live for themselves. Stop serving sin. Stop serving self. Stop doing what you want to do, but instead live for Him who died for them and rose again. You see, that's motivation. The cross is motivation. I have to be faithful. I have to attend services. I have to live a moral life. I have to pray. I have to study my Bible. In fact, I have to because that's what he, he did all these things for me. You see, there's a motivation. There's a life-changing aspect of this. And no longer can I think only of myself. No longer can I think only of living for sin, living for the flesh. But this cross of Christ, every time I think of it, motivates me to greater service, to doing more for the Lord. There's no, there's none of, there's no room in Christianity for saying, well, I've arrived. I can retire now. I can kind of take it easy and coast in. I don't have to do anything more. I've taught my share of the classes. I, 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 I've waited on the table long enough. I've led singing enough. Now I'm going to sit back and take it easy and just sort of coast into heaven. No, 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 no time for that. You do what you can. Now, health may prohibit sometimes. We understand that. As you get older, health may prohibit you doing some of the things that you used to do. But you keep doing what you can for as long as you can. You never stop. You never stop. Why? Because of the cross. Because of what Jesus did. Because He gave the ultimate 
sacrifice, and I've got to give the ultimate sacrifice. I've got, I got to do something to give back, something for what Jesus did to me. So I'm motivated by the cross to humble obedience, no longer living for myself, but living for him who died for me. I apply the cross to the way I live my life. Every day we get up in the morning and, and we don't usually think of it in this way, but we start making decisions. What am I going to do today? Am I going to go to work today or am I going to call in sick and, and play? And if I go to work, am I going to give them an honest day's work for an honest day's pay or am I going to sort of shirk on the job and not do what I'm supposed to do? And uh, as I go in there and meet my wife, uh, who was gracious enough to cook breakfast for me this morning, how am I going to treat her? Am I going to cut her head off and bark at her or am I going to say, good morning, honey, I love you. It's great to see you again today. You see, it, it, it affects everything that we do. And, and so we, we take the cross and we apply it to the way that we live our lives. Then when you go to work, how do you treat your fellow employees? When you drive down the highway and somebody cuts you off, you going to cuss at them? Or are you going to say, God bless you, I'll pray for you? You know, it's, it's, it's all up to you how you react, isn't it? It's all up to you how you react. W don't let the, the flesh get the best of you. You're going to face temptations all day long. You're going to be deciding. Will I engage in that sin, or will I say no? All day long, that's going to be happening. The devil's going to be throwing stuff at you all day long. Temptation to do this, temptation to, temptation to lie, th temptation to, to, to commit adultery, temptation to drink, temptation to whatever it is. It's going to be thrown at you all day long. What are you going to do with it? And the cross, if you keep that foremost in your mind, can change and revolutionize the way you live your life. A couple of places where this is mentioned in the book of Galatians. In chapter 5, and while you're flipping over there, remind you of the context here, Paul sets forth two pathways, for lack of a better word. There's the works of the flesh, you can live that way, or there's the fruit of the Spirit, you can live that way. You can, you can choose which way you're going to go, and you can see, backing up here to verse 19, just for starters, now the works of the flesh are evident, everybody knows what these are. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresy, envy, murder, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, which means the list isn't complete. More could be added, of which I tell you before, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Can't live that way and go to heaven. Not going to do it. Not going to happen. But on the flip side, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, against such there is no law. Did you know that? There isn't a law against any of these things. You can love all you want to. You can have joy all you want to. Have all the peace you want. Long-suffering, why, you can be long-suffering as long as the day is, as, as, goes on. Kindness, all the kindness you want. Goodness, all you can do that all you want to. Indulge yourself. There's no law against these things, you see. But then we get down here to the nitty-gritty, verse 24. And those who are Christ have crucified. There's your cross. There's your cross right there. You see, he's bringing that imagery in because the cross is central to our lives. And to crucify is to put to death. And those who are Christ have crucified. They've put to death the flesh with its passions and desires. That means the pathway of verse 19, 20, and 21 is closed to me. The pathway of 19, 20, and 21 is closed to you. You've crucified the flesh. You've put that to death. That's gone out of your life, you see. You've crucified that. So you can't live that. And you're applying the cross to your life, you see. Jesus was crucified. Now I'm crucifying the flesh. I'm putting that to death. I'm not going to live that way. That pathway is closed to me. You've come to a fork in the road, flesh or spirit. And if you understand the cross, the way of the flesh is closed. Can't go that way. That leads to disaster. That leads to death. In fact, if you drop down here to chapter 6 and verse 7, do not be deceived, God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. He who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. Notice the he there, that's a generic he. It doesn't make any difference who you are, saint or sinner, Christian or not, black or white, rich or poor, male or female. You sow the flesh, you're going to reap corruption. That's the way it's going to work. God doesn't play favorites. He doesn't play favorites. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Now drop down here to verse 14. But God forbid that I should glory, except in the cross. There it is, the cross. Glory in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. I have put the world to death, 
not living that way any longer. That way is closed to me, the way of worldliness, the way of sin, the way of the flesh. That way is closed to me. I've crucified it. Just as surely as Jesus was nailed to the cross, I've nailed the flesh to the cross. It's dead to me. It means nothing to me. Now those things are easy to stand up here and say until those temptations start coming. And they do come, don't they? They come every day. They come at me, they come at you, they come at all of us. And the devil knows exactly where to hit us. He knows where we're weak. Some people are weak in this area. Others are weak in that area. The devil knows that. And he's not going to hit you over here where you're strong. He's going to hit you over here where you're weak. That's exactly what he's going to do. That's good, tac that's good tactics. When you're going to fight a war, you hit them at their weak point. That's exactly what you do. And the devil is going to hit you at your weak point. And so it's easy to stand up here and say that. Well, I've crucified the flesh. I'm crucified to the world. The world is crucified. It's easy to say. Not so easy to put into practice, but you have to. That's what this is saying. Let that cross change you. Crucify the flesh. Be crucified to the world. And let the world be crucified to you. Death. Separation. Can it live that way any longer? But there's more. I repay the cross by sacrificing for Jesus. Turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 9. Had a sermon on this a few months back, that, just that one verse, Luke 9 and verse 23. You remember that? It was a four-point sermon. This passage divides itself into nice four sections here, Luke 9 and verse 23. If I ever get my Bible over there. Jesus said, if anyone desires to come after me. There's point number one. It's up to you. It's what you want. See? Free will. If anyone desires to come after me, number two, let him deny himself. Point number three, take up his what? Cross. What? Cross. There's your cross. There's your cross. You see, we got, what is that song we sing? Uh, there's a cross for everyone, and there's a cross for me. Must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? No. There's a cross for everyone, and there's a cross for me. Take up your cross. Now, you're not taking up his cross. He's the only one who could take that cross up. But you're taking up your cross, and you do it daily. And then the fourth point, follow me. Follow me. Now, I've said this before, and I think it bears repeating here. When he says take up your cross, he's not talking about having a little bit of arthritis and a little bit of bursitis. And, and, and oh, that's my, we all got our crosses to bear. That's not what he's talking about. Look at the next verse. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. You see that? He's talking about dying. He's talking about making the ultimate sacrifice here. Making the ultimate sacrifice for you. Why? Why would I do that? Why would I die for Jesus? Because he died for you. That's why. That's exactly why. You repay it. You're paying back the favor in kind. And I think this principle can be expanded to, to, to sacrifices that we make for Jesus. Look at what Paul went through. Stoned, persecuted. From town to town, the Jews would chase him from city to city. And they would stir up the multitudes against him. That's sacrificing for Jesus. He was willing to die. In fact, he was stoned one time. We just read this the other night in, in the Wednesday Bible study. He was stoned left for dead. They left him, they stoned him and left him there as though he were dead. And he got right up and he went right back into the very city where they stoned him. Instead of going the other way, that's what I'd probably done. I'd run the other direction. Right, they don't want me there. I'm gone. But no, Paul said, I'm going right back into that town. These brethren need to see this. These brethren who I just baptized need to see me get up and they need to see me go right back into town there and to be unafraid and to be willing to sacrifice for my Lord, to be willing to die for my Lord because he died for me. You see, the cross, the cross touches every part of our life. The cross is the heart of the gospel. You embrace it when you're converted. You remember it every Sunday. You emulate it when you give. You're humbled by it to be a better person, to be a humble person. You're motivated by it to obedience. You apply it to the way you live. You crucify the flesh with its passions and love, and you repay it by being willing to die for the Lord. Be thou faithful unto death, we quote many times. That means even if I have to die. That doesn't mean be faithful all my life long. I think it includes that. But what it really literally means is be faithful even if you have to die. Even if you have to actually go to a cross and die for Jesus. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give unto thee the crown of life. But you know, there's one more point. Because sometimes we think, boy, that's too much. You know, here you are in the middle of your Christian walk, the middle of your Christian life, and you say, that's too much. I can't handle that anymore. 
I'm just going to give up on the cross and I'm going to go back to the world. It's a lot easier. And it is for a while until the judgment day comes. It's easier for a while. But here's, here's the thing. Here's where the cross is still touching you. You're not going to get away from the cross, folks. Because listen, when you fall away, you disgrace it. You ain't going to get away from this. That you're not getting away from the cross. It is the central event of human history, and you're not getting away from this. You can't walk away from it. You walk away, you, you're going to be held responsible for that. Turn to Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 6. The Hebrew writer is warning. The entire book of Hebrews is a warning against apostasy, against falling away, which is why it amazes me that there are people out there who say, you can't fall away. Are you kidding me? What are you going to do with the book of Hebrews? The whole thing is about falling away. The whole book is a warning against falling away. And in Hebrews 6, verses 4 through 6, he says, It is impossible. Stop right there. If you write in your Bibles, right after the word impossible, right next to the word for, put a parenthesis right there, an open parenthesis. And, and then I want you to go all the way down here to verse 6, where it says, If they fall away, and close the parenthesis. Okay? I want you, if you write in your Bibles, just do that. And we'll take that little parenthesis section completely out of the picture here for just a second. He says in verse 4, it is impossible. Something's impossible. Something's impossible here. What is it? What's impossible? Well, if you drop down here to verse 6, after the closed parenthesis, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance. That's what's impossible, see. It's impossible to renew these people to repentance. Well, who are you talking about? Now, now we bring in the parenthesis. Who are you talking about? Those who were once enlightened, that is, their minds have been enlightened by the truth. They've tasted the heavenly gift. They've become Christians. They've been partakers of the Holy Spirit, the blessings that the Holy Spirit shed forth in Christ Jesus. Tasted the good word of God and the powers of the... He's talking about a Christian here. But then something happens in verse 6. They fall away. They fall away. That's the man you can't renew. And why is it? Here, he's going to tell you why you can't renew him to repentance in the rest of verse 6. Since they... Crucify, there's your cross, there it is. Since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put Him to an open shame. You see, here's the picture that's being painted. When the Jews crucified Jesus the first time, in a manner of speaking, what they were saying is, get out of my life. We don't like you, we're not going to follow you, and we're not going to do anything you say, get out of our world. They, they, they drove Jesus out of their world. And when you turn your back on Jesus after having served Him, and you turn your back on Jesus, you're doing exactly the same thing. I tried it, and I don't like it. I want no part of it. I want Jesus out of me. You're crucifying Him again. You're, putting him to, you're doing the same thing the Jews did. Rejecting the Son of God. Rejecting the cross. Rejecting the love of God. Rejecting the very thing that can save you from hell. And so, there's no getting away from this, folks. There's no getting away from the cross. It was the single most important event in human history, life-altering for each and every one of us, potentially saving, potentially getting us to heaven. But if we turn away from it, there's no, other place, there's no, no place else to go. Remember what Jesus said to Peter? Some of the disciples, this is in John 6, some of the disciples went back and stopped following Jesus. And Jesus looked at his apostles and he said, Will you also go away? Are you going to leave me too? And Peter said, Lord, where are we going to go? Thou hast the words of eternal. You leave Jesus, folks. You leave him. There's no place else to go except to hell. There's no place else to go. It's Jesus or hell. It's, it, it's the, it's the no-win scenario of going straight to hell. Or it's Jesus and the potential of going to heaven. To me, that's a no-brainer, folks. What are you going to do with Jesus? What are you going to do with the cross? What are you going to do? Are you going to let that change your life? I hope so. You have a chance to do that here this morning. Behind me is the baptistry. You can get started by embracing the cross. You can die to your sins, Romans 6. You can be buried with Christ in baptism. You can be raised to walk in a new life. That can start today. That can start in, within the next 15 minutes. If someone comes and desires, that can, that can be done before you leave here today. Start that journey. Make the cross the center of your life. If we can help you do that, please come while we stand and while we sing.